Welcome back, everyone. Well, a common question that I get on this channel anytime there's a discussion of a great leader, a great general, is would you say that person, Napoleon, Julius Caesar, Hannibal, whoever it might be, is the greatest general of all time? And my answer is usually the same, and that is you can't really rank one versus another from different eras. It's kind of like comparing Michael Jordan and LeBron James. I think it's just an unfair comparison to make because they played in different eras with different play styles and different rules and different things happening and uh, the game was played differently. And the same thing's true in war. Uh, a man who performed exceptionally well in the 19th century uh, can't really be compared to a man who led armies 2,000 years earlier. It's just not fair to do so because uh, the situations are different, the circumstances are different, the tactics needed to win are different, uh, the cultures are different. There's so many things. And so what I typically say instead is, well, that person needs to be in the conversation. So, you know, if we're talking about Napoleon or Julius Caesar, for example, I say you can't have a conversation about the greatest general of all time without including people like that. But to rank one through 10 or anything like that, I think it's just impossible. Having said that, there is a video uh, that I just stumbled across and it's um, by a channel called We Are The Mighty. They've got about 200,000 subscribers and uh, I thought it seemed like an intriguing thing to check out. It's called The Top 10 Generals of All Time According to the Math. Now I haven't watched this yet, so number one, I don't know what generals are going to be included and I don't know, number two, what the criteria, the math is that's being used, but I thought it would be interesting to check it out, so let's do so together. Someone went and moneyballed military history. Ethan Arsht applied the principles of baseball sabermetrics to the performances of history's greatest general's ability to win battles, and he came up with a list of the 10 best generals of all time. The math is tricky, but the list is definitive. There are just a few caveats. Although an imperfect source, Arsht compiled Wikipedia data from 3,580 battles. And I will say this, and you guys see me use Wikipedia sometimes. Um, is Wikipedia a perfect source? No. Would I use it if I was writing a, a paper for college? No, I don't th even think you can. That said, I think it gets a bad rap as being bad source, uh, especially about information uh, about well-documented historical events like generals, battles, things like that. They've got their sources there. So if you're unsure about something, look to the sources. But I find Wikipedia to be a really good place to easily access some quick information uh, if I'm just looking to try and find something like a, a real five minute like lookup of something. If I'm doing a deep dive or like I'm doing research for the book I'm writing right now, no, I'm not going to use Wikipedia. Uh, but I don't think it's the terrible source that a lot of people blame it for being. And 6,619 generals. He then compiled lists of key commanders, total forces, and of course the outcome. The general's forces were categorized and his numerical advantage or disadvantage would By the way, these are scenes from the movie Waterloo, which is one of the greatest war movies of all time. It is absolutely phenomenal. And if you have even a passing interest in Napoleonic warfare, you have to check that movie out. Need it to reflect tactical ability. The real power is ranking the general's war score. As Christopher or Plummer is above replacement. Wellington. The more battles a commander fought and won, the more opportunities to raise their scores. But fighting fewer battles didn't necessarily help. There were some surprises in the model, like the apparent failures of generals like Robert E. Lee. From well, and that just goes to show you that a guy like Robert E. Lee was not the perfect general that a lot of people want to make him out to be. He wasn't even the best general in the Civil War. I don't think he was even one of the top three or four generals in the Civil War. Um, and it'll be interesting to see like someone like Alexander the Great, for example, who was a phenomenal general and probably needs to be in that conversation, but who f didn't fight very many battles. And so there's a much smaller sample size there. More modern generals like Patton, who didn't make the top 10, the relatively small number of battles commanded attributed to their absence. For more about Arsht's results, responses to criticism, and his findings, check out our website in the link below. Remember, this list has nothing to do with overall strategy, and it's all in good fun. So just take it easy. Yeah, exactly. Trolls. Okay, let's get started. Number 10, Alexander the Great. Alexander was born in 356 BCE, and he would go on to create... And I have a feeling the reason why they're not going to put him higher is that whole thing I just mentioned about he just didn't fight that many battles. 
one of the largest empires in the ancient world. He earned his first victory in battle at the age of 16 and became the king of Macedonia at the age of 20. Alexander was a great strategist. In fact, he won every battle that he himself commanded. Yep. But since his life was cut short and he had only nine battles from which to draw data, it leaves the model very little to work with. Still, the conqueror of the known world is ranked much higher than other leaders with similar numbers, including the Japanese shogun Tokugawa, German Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, and Confederate General J.E.B. Stewart. I don't it know why you'd even. I don't know why you'd even talk about Jeb Stewart in there. Jeb Stewart was a cavalry commander who didn't fight that many battles in which he was the guy in charge. He was usually under someone else like Robert E. Lee, and that's where a lot of these generals. Again, it gets really tricky because. A guy like Patton, for example, was always under somebody else's command. Um, so who do you give the credit for those battles to? Um, one of the things that's amazing about Alexander the Great is the amount of territory he conquered in such a short time. He was like, you know, in his early 30s when he died. Uh, what he did, he did in a short time, and he did over a huge span of territory at a time when it wasn't easy to cover that kind of ground. And he did it with a relatively small army. Alexander's per battle war average is higher than anyone else's on this list. Number 9. Georgi Shukov. Georgi Konstantinovich Shukov is perhaps the most acclaimed Soviet commander from World War II. His victory at the Battle of Kursk, the largest tank battle in history, is remembered as the turning point in the war against the Germans. And now, a lot of people argue that whole point about the Battle of Kursk being the largest tank battle in history. Uh, and Provkarova, I think is uh, the name, I probably butchered that name, is the specific part of the Battle of Kursk. It's so tricky talking about battles because in World War II, a lot of times battles were really more campaigns like Stalingrad. I mean, that was like the better part of a year. Um, the battle for Verdun in World War I was uh, something like nine months. Uh, so, you know, these aren't like a battle in the Civil War or the um, Napoleonic Wars where you have a battle for a day or two and that's it. And you have these massive casualties. The battles in World War One and World War Two are sometimes campaigns that go on for months. And so uh, the Battle of Kursk is really a, a huge area of battles. The Battle of the Bulge on the Western Front was, was a big, wide area of fighting. Um, but yeah, Zhukov is clearly the best general on the Soviet side uh, and clearly one of the best generals in all of World War II and in all of modern warfare for that matter. So I have no problem at all with him being on this list. In his assault against Berlin in 1945 hastened the end of the war. Zhukov has only one more battle than Alexander and his overall score barely squeaks by the Macedonian. Interesting. And, and I should mention one more thing, if and I've mentioned this before. If you like kind of dark humor, check out the movie, The Death of Stalin. It's hilarious and remarkably close to the real history while being kind of a satirical, funny look at that time in history. Uh, and Jason Isaacs is just brilliant as Zhukov. He, he pulls that off so well. I love his character in that movie so much. Interestingly enough, his score is far, far above that of General Douglas MacArthur or Confederate Generals Jubal Early and John Bell Hood. Why do we keep talking about guys like Jubal Early? Why are we even mentioning someone like him? He, he wasn't even in the top 10 or 20 generals in the Civil War. Why would he even be in this conversation? I'm not really sure why they're just pulling names out of the hat like that. That's what overcoming the odds does for your war score. Number eight. Frederick the Great. Mm. Frederick II ruled Prussia, a powerful kingdom within the Germanic Empire during the 18th century. His military prowess... Ex within the Germanic Empire is kind of misleading because Prussia did become a part of the German Empire much later, but there was no German Empire at this time. Prussia was the German power. Um, and they were certainly, uh, for their size, they were punching way above. I mean, pound for pound, the best army in the world, I think expanded Prussian lands and his political influence brought Prussia to the front of European affairs. Ruling for more than 40 years and commanding troops in some 14 battles across Europe earned the enlightened Prussian ruler the number eight spot on this list. His per battle average was also lower than Alexander's, but on the whole, he was just a better tactician. Hmm. Number seven, 
Ulysses S. Grant. Yep. Ulysses S. Grant led the Union Army to victory during the American Civil War and went on to serve as President of the United States from 1869 to 1877. Grant's performance commanding Union troops in 16 battles earned him the seventh spot on this list, as well as the U.S. presidency. Although his performance on the battlefield is clearly much better than those of his contemporaries, it should be noted that his Civil War arch rival, Robert E. Lee, is so far below him on the list that he actually has a negative score. <laughs> um, interesting. I I'm very curious to actually check out the algorithms and all the stuff that they used for this. I don't know if that's stuff that's available or not, but um, here's the thing. And I, I the Civil War is my wheelhouse. For those of you who are new to the channel, if there's one area of history I would consider myself to be an expert, it would be the American Civil War. Um, yeah, 150 plus years of uh, people trying to spin things their way have led a lot of people to believe that Grant was a butcher who just hurled massive amounts of men at Robert E. Lee and bludgeoned him into submission until the South ran out of manpower. That is not at all the case. Uh, Grant was a brilliant strategist. He wasn't, he was not the best tactician on the battlefield in the American Civil War. He wouldn't even be probably one of the top 10, but he was a brilliant strategist. I think by far the best strategist, uh, in the war and maybe one of the best in American history. Um, and that was why he beat Lee. He understood how to win. Lee was a great tactician on the battlefield, but never really strung victories together in such a way as to win the war. Now, you can argue he had a lot of things going against him that made that impossible, and that's a fair assessment to make, but I just don't think that Lee is this far and away better general than Grant was at all. And I think the, the spin that Grant just bludgeoned the South to, get, to death with numbers is very disingenuous. Look at the Vicksburg campaign. I did a whole series from Vicksburg talking about the Vicksburg campaign. Brilliant campaign. Absolutely brilliant. Number six, Hannibal mm, Barca. Yep. Hannibal is notoriously considered one of the greatest military strategists of all time and the greatest enemy Rome ever faced. Born in 247 BCE, he was a general of ancient Carthage known for his conquest of Hispania, the Second Punic War, and the Roman Seleucid War. Hannibal, once captured by Scipio Africanus, is believed to have given his own ranking system to Scipio once the two started talking. His personal assessment wasn't far off from the truth. And Hannibal's another one of those guys that I think always comes up in the conversation for greatest generals. Um, I don't know if I'd put him in my top 10, uh, just because I think that we can't include too many from that same era of a couple of hundred years there. Uh, and I, I just think that Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar are my two from that time period. He listed Alexander the Great and himself as best, both of whom are in the top 10, even centuries later. Number five, Khalid ibn mm. al-Walid. I don't know a lot about him. Al-Walid was a companion of the Prophet Muhammad and one of the Islamic Empire's most capable military commanders. His leadership united Arabia under a single leader for the first time in history. He's known for commanding the forces of the Rashidun army under Muhammad and his successors of the Rashidun Caliphate. It's rumored that he fought in over 100 conflicts and skirmishes, wow. but he's best remembered for 14 significant battles. In which so I'll admit, I do not know a lot about early uh, Arab or uh, Islamic history, and that's something that I want to change at some point. I do want to dive into some more of that. I know we have a lot of followers from um, Arab countries, a lot of Islamic followers, and we're glad to have you, and I definitely want to get into some more of that history. So if you know more about this guy and you want to use the comment section below, please let us know why should he be one of the top 10 generals. He remained undefeated against the Byzantine Empire and the Sassanid Persians and helped spread Islam to the greater Middle East. Compared to others who fought similar numbers of battles, his score eclipses even Frederick the Great. Hmm. Number four, Takeda Singen. Being one of the best military minds in feudal Japan is really a big deal because almost everyone seemed to be a military mind. That's the thing. I mean, when you are a great military leader in a military culture, that's saying something. Again, as I've acknowledged before, I don't know a lot about East Asian history, Japan, Korea, China, uh, places like that. So uh, something, again, I want to learn more about. You know, Admiral Yi, to me, uh, is just such a phenomenal story coming out of Korea. Uh, although he's an admiral, not really a general, though he won some battles uh, that can be considered, I think, in this list, too. But 
and being better than someone else might mean you get challenged to a duel. After 18 battles, the Tiger of Kai reigned supreme, in Japan anyway. During the 14th century, Takeda Singen was a prominent daimyo, or feudal lord, renowned for his military prowess and aggressive tactics in battle. His domestic policies, including systems of law, taxation, and administration, were later incorporated into the shogunate that would unite Japan. Number three, Arthur Wellesley, first Duke of Wellington. Though he would become prime minister, Wellesley is best known for his military accolades. It's a pretty big deal to be the guy who delivered a solid defeat to the man they called Master of Europe. And the funny thing is, most people, when they talk about Wellington, they always talk about uh, Waterloo, but they forget that he had a long career before Waterloo, places like Spain, for example. Napoleon's old nemesis, the Duke of Wellington commanded famous victories during the Napoleonic Wars, including the defeat of Bonaparte at Waterloo. Like Takeda Singen, his nearest challenger on this list, the Duke saw command of 18 battles, but his war score is considerably higher. Number two, Julius Caesar. He's Napoleon's number Before one. Before he declared himself dictator for life and found himself infamously murdered by all of his friends, Julius Caesar expanded the Roman Republic through conquests across modern Europe. Caesar didn't have command in as many battles as Singen or the Duke of Wellington, but his war score reflects a lot more risk and shrewdness in his battle. And uh, one of the things about Caesar, and it's always tricky because we don't know, we don't have independent sources for a lot of his battles. Most of what we know about his battles comes from him. But that's kind of cool that what we have is one of the greatest generals of all time writing down his own version of the events that led to those battles and the battles themselves. So while we have to kind of cautiously um, read through his, uh, his memoirs, it's fantastic stuff. And it gives us such an incredible insight. And it's amazing that it got passed down and survived for 2,000 years. Uh, absolutely a phenomenal general. Most people, when they talk about Caesar, they think of you know, the last couple of years, his kind of dictatorship of Rome. But they forget that who he really was was just an incredibly gifted general who did so much with what he had. Field tactics. But even Caesar couldn't top Alexander's per battle war average. Number one, yep. Napoleon Bonaparte. Yes, you might have guessed by now, but the number one spot belongs to L'Empereur. Napoleon is so far ahead of the normal distribution curve created by the data for these 6,000 plus generals, it's not even close. After 43 battles, he has a war score of more than 16, which blows the competition away. There could be no question, the man responsible for conquering an enormous expanse of Europe during the 19th century is the greatest tactical general of all time. And if if you, I know I mentioned at the beginning, you can't do it, but if you were to force me, you know, if you were to force me to pick one person that was the greatest general of all time, I think it's got to be Napoleon. Uh, you know, just the guy won everywhere he went, and, and it took basically the entire European continent to take him down, not once, but twice. Uh, anytime you gave him even odds on a battlefield, you had no chance. I mean, you really just had no chance. And in fact, a lot of times you, he had much less than even odds and managed to win and a lot of battles to show for it too. Big mistakes. Let's not, let's not ignore. He made some big mistakes. Russia, I mean, you can't get around. What, what the world would be like if he had not invaded Russia uh, and how the world might be different. Uh, I don't see how he could have possibly been defeated if he hadn't lost his army in Russia uh, and on the march to and from. But yeah, pound for pound, um, I don't know that anybody else could even compare to him. And the math proves it. So that's Okay, so I guess that's it. So let me know your thoughts. Who would you put in your top 10 that wasn't mentioned on this list and why? Use the comment section below. Uh, and if you want to learn a little bit more about Napoleon, uh, I did uh, do a reaction series to uh, the first part of the series done by Epic History TV on Napoleonic Wars. We are going to get back to that pretty soon and pick up where it left off with, uh, I think, starting with episode seven. So if you want to check out the link uh, up there in the description or uh, on the screen there, uh, you can check those videos out. Thanks for watching.